Uh, thank you for having me, Jerry, and really thank you to, uh, to everyone who's taking time out of their day to listen to the things that I have to say, particularly those who, like me, are on the East Coast and it's the lunch hour. Uh, thank you for taking your lunch hour to spend with me. Um, so I'm as, well, I guess I don't need to introduce myself anymore. Jerry, Jerry did that. Um, I, I'm in a funny position. I work for NIST, but I work at Brookhaven. So I'm a physicist at uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a part of the United States Department of Commerce. And I'm the lead beamline scientist at uh, the Beamline for Materials Measurements here at NSLS2. Now, I, I know that this being the Global XS Club, um, that we have people from everywhere uh, here. So I wanted to start with a little bit of geolocation to make it clear where my beamline is uh, on sort of all the length scales. So I think everybody is familiar with that location. And we zoom in on the East Coast of the United States and here's uh, New York State. Uh, we zoom in a little bit closer and the Southern part of New York State is this island that's called Long Island. Uh, the West End of Long Island is part of New York City. And uh, Brookhaven is about a hundred a little bit more than 100 kilometers east of New York City. So if we look at the motorway map, you drive all the way out to this intersection right here, and you get off the freeway and head a little bit north, and you are at Brookhaven National Laboratory. And the synchrotron is this um, funny sort of uh, circle with five blocks on it here in the, the middle of the picture. Uh, looking at it from above, this is the, the NSLS-2. Uh, my beam line is down here at the southern end of the building. And I, I like this picture a lot uh, because it sort of shows the history of synchrotron science here at Brookhaven. Right across the street is this building right here, which is the old National Synchrotron Light Source, which had its last light in 2014. So that's eight years ago now that we moved across the street to this much bigger building. Uh, going inside the building, um, Going in, whoops, I can't do that. I have to keep the camera pointed at me. Going inside the building, um, we see uh, uh, that 6BM is this beam line right here that is in this clutch of spectroscopy and imaging beam lines uh, at the sort of southeast part of, of the building. And then going inside, uh, standing up on the roof of a neighboring hutch, here are the uh, hutches for 6BM. This is kind of an old picture. You can see that this is after the hutches were constructed, but before the photon delivery system was put into the uh, put into the beam line. So this is about a five-year-old picture, five and a half-year-old picture at this point. Um, but it gives you a sense of what the layout of the beam line is. Uh, so now getting down to uh, the the details of what the beam line is. Um, uh, the, my first, my leading comment is that uh, BMM is, it's a pretty standard beam line. There's not a lot in terms of the instrumentation in the photon delivery system that is, um, well, I mean, I don't want to say that it's not interesting. It's just not very unique. It's much like everybody else's XS beam line. Um, it, right at this point in the history of synchrotron radiation, we have a pretty good sense of how to build an XS beam line. And, and so that's exactly what we did. Um, in, in fact, this is gonna be a theme that I'm gonna re return to several times throughout my talk. Um, I'm going to show you throughout the whole talk how we do things at BMM. There's very little in this entire presentation that is exactly novel. Uh, everything that uh, everything I'm going to talk about has been done in some form by somebody else already. Uh, uh, it, 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 what I mean by that is I've tried to accumulate all the best ideas that I could find to make a productive beamline with a very positive user experience. And the, as, as you'll see as we go on, the point of the presentation that I'm giving is to not so much talk about the beamline, which as I said, is a rather standard XS beam line, but I want to talk about some ideas that I've had, some things I've been thinking about in the last few years about the user experience when somebody comes to an XS beam line. Uh, 
So um, the one possibly interesting part, or most in, possibly most interesting part about the beamline is that we have a collimating mirror in the front end. Uh, and that's of course, because we wanted it to be as close to the source as possible so that we could gather as much of the diverging radiation from the source as possible. Um, because it's in the front end and because of like all of the challenges associated with dealing with instrumentation in the front end, mainly it's just extreme inaccessibility for much of the calendar. Um, we chose to have a fixed angle, fixed figure mirror. It's a, a paraboloid mirror uh, that lives um, about 13 meters away from the source uh, and spends its whole life locked up in the front end. We got it lined up in the early days of the beam line and we very rarely move it uh, since then. Uh, going downstream, we have two side-by-side -side monochromators that just the whole vacuum vessel translates back and forth to go between the two sets of crystals. Uh, after that, we have a, uh, a, tor a, ben a toroid on a bender uh, as a focusing mirror. And after that, a flat harmonic rejection mirror. Uh, this gives us several, um, several modes of operation um, because we can have focused or unfocused beam over the whole uh, range of energy. It leads to a number of different um, uh, photon delivery modes, depending upon which mirrors are in and what angle they're at. And so as you can see from the, the sort of schematic that, I've, that I'm showing here, that has the consequence that as we go to different photon delivery modes, the beam will enter the end station at a different height and a different inclination depending upon the states of the two mirrors. And so in our operations, we have to follow the fact that the beam enters the hutch at different heights and different inclinations. Uh, and then the last little bit of the, the last thing to mention about the beam line is we, you know, as one does, we have diagnostics of various sorts and different parts of the beam line that, that you know, help us keep everything running. Um, here's sort of the broad details of the beam line. Um, we have an energy range that at the high end is limited by the fact that we have this fixed angle, fixed figure mirror in the front end. Uh, and so our cutoff is 23.5. Uh, that's a pretty sensible number given the properties of the source. The, the source is also starting to peter out at around the same energy. Um, it, this was a consequence. This is a design consequence. It means there are some rather interesting and important elements, uh, palladium, silver, uh, you know, tellurium, things like that, whose K edge as we cannot reach. The energy range at the low end is pretty much limited by the fact that we have not yet engineered some kind of air exclusion environment uh, to be around the sample. Um, I, I, the approximately 4.3 number comes from the fact that in the last cycle, uh, we measured um, uh, some tellurium L3 and some scandium K and did a pretty good job on both. They were pretty concentrated samples, so they weren't super hard experiments, but we were able to get data down to about the 4.3 range of, of you know, acceptable quality. Uh, we have um, the two different modes of delivery, a focus spot that's about 250 uh, microns full width half max, uh, and then the unfocused beam, which can be as big as eight by one and the eight is defined by the first aperture on the beam line and uh, the, the one is just a convenient number. Um, the other nice thing about the beam line is we have a lot of good services in the beam line. We have just on tap, ready to go. We've got gaseous nitrogen, uh, compressed air. Uh, I have plumbing for liquid nitrogen in the hutch, although it's not been used yet. We have a hoist overhead for picking heavy things up onto the experimental table. Uh, and, and PCW, uh, process chilled water available for cooling, um, ventilation. So we're pretty well equipped for a wide variety of experiments. And then our software, our software environment is we're, we're an epic shop here at the light source and uh, uh, I, at the Beamline, we use the whole blue sky ecosystem uh, for, for running the Beamline. Uh, so here's a picture of um, my end station. It's like I have been saying, it's a pretty standard setup. We have the full complement of ion chambers and I'm actually gonna talk a bit more about ion chambers at the end of the talk. Um, we have a four element uh, silicon drift detector and an Express 3X uh, backend. 
um, have a sample stage with sort of all of the, uh, you know, all the possible degrees of motion and rotational freedom that we need by just putting different, you know, we have a whole bunch of stages on hand that can be mounted on the XY stage. And um, uh, back here, we keep a bunch of reference foils always in the beam and selectable easily. I'll talk about that again in a sec. Uh, and lots of cameras. I point a lot of cameras at the experiment because that's super helpful. Um, we have a lot of stuff at the beam line as, you know, as XS beam lines do. We have a lovely uh, six channel potentiostat. Uh, although I have not been doing a lot of electrochemistry experiments since COVID began, because uh, those tend to require people being on site and it's taking a little bit of time for those experiments to be coming back to my beam line. Uh, we have a couple of temperature stages, a uh, sort of helium compressor cryostat and uh, one of those Lincoln stages that has a heater, but can also take a, a liquid nitrogen flowing through it. And then we have this uh, fun, fancy, uh, glancing angle stage that lets us do glancing angle x axis and have a lot of samples mounted up, uh, mounted up at the same time. Uh, the beam line, you know, it it works. It's a pretty good beam line, and our users are pretty happy and pretty productive. Uh, I just went to the publications page and pulled up the six most recent uh, high profile publications. Uh, whatever high profile means to the Department of Energy, those are them. Um, and you know, so my, my users uh, are doing doing good science, and that's of course a thing that uh, I take a lot of pride in. Um, so now I feel I should talk a little bit about how the user interacts with the beam line. So time to talk about the the the, the GUI at BMM. But um, wait, wait, hang on a second. Um, we don't have a GUI. Our users run the beam line from an IPython command line. Um, and, and so it seems right now, I, I, this is, so I'll, I'll, say, I'll say right now that this is going to be, even though it's not very far into the talk, this is my first stopping point. I figured there'd be some questions about the beam line. So I'm gonna stop here in a sec uh, with a little bit of a cliffhanger. The cliffhanger being that um, the title of my talk is about the user experience at the beam line. And it seems as though I'm saying that we party like it's 1999 at BMM. Um, I mean, of course, of course, I'm going to have, I, of course, the situation is a bit more involved and a bit more sophisticated than that. But the sentence, the statement that we don't have a GUI, that we use a command line to run the beam line is in fact a true statement and is the lead into the rest of my talk where I'm going to be talking about the user experience, which I think is a really different concept, of course, from a user interface. Uh, but I see there's at least one question about the beam line. So Jerry, so, why, don't we, uh, why don't we take that first? All right, uh, Matthew Marcus, you have a question. Yeah, so I was wondering about the uh, that lower energy limit and whether it, uh, if, if you do get rid of the air problem, uh, or, uh, you know, what the limit will be uh, just due to the monochromator maximum Bragg angle and whether beryllium is in the way. So we certainly do have uh, two beryllium windows in the beam path. There's one way up in the front end to protect the storage ring from us. Um, and uh, uh, there's another one at the end of the photon delivery system before the beam comes out into air at the uh, at the table. Uh, in fact, it's uh, it's hidden inside of this snout right here. Um, so so that's the beryllium situation. Um, the mechanical limit. Um, yeah, I should have anticipated this question and and recalculated what it is. It's something like 3.1 or 3.2 keV. Um, okay, that's a so funny number. Solar. It's a funny number and it has to do with the history of the acquisition of the monochromator. And at one point we had to redesign the crystal cage and at the, uh, to not spend a ridiculous amount of money on the redesign, we had to live with a few uh, limitations in terms of what energy range we could uh, we could accommodate, and so sulfur is not a possibility. Calcium certainly is, 
And I mean, there's no reason why we couldn't measure calcium today other than the fact that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the photons wouldn't make it to the detector. Um, yeah, you would have to do air, uh, you'd have to do a, 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 va a little vacuum chamber or, or a helium chamber or, uh, or a beam bag. Ex exactly. And, and as I, I think you'll get from what the rest of the talk is going to be about, I'm disinclined to do a bag because I think it would, I, I, I think that's hard to do in a way that's effective and makes for a good user experience. Yeah. But a properly engineered solution is definitely something that's on my wish list. It's not, it's not necessarily at the top of my list, but that really is just saying something about how long my wish list is, not uh, how important. Right. Uh, measuring calcium. I, I, did a, I did a bag a couple of times for Satish Maneni on you know, doing chlorine, and uh, I'd rather not do that again. Okay. Uh, I mean, fond memories of grad school. Uh, uh, Matt Newville probably remembers going to chess and putting bags over experiments for Peter Livens' experiment. All right. Um, a question from Edmund Velter. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, no. Hi, <laughs> Bruce. Yes. Um, I was wondering about the distance between the source and the collimating mirror. We, we, I'm meters. starting. 50 meters, okay. 13, uh, and that's, one three. Yeah, okay, 13, okay. Because we are starting to, to think about XF beamline for Petra 4, and I'm thinking also about three pole wigglers and things and how to collect the divergence. So, yeah, in, okay, in that's case, working. In our case, um, that number was determined because it was the closest we could get to the source while still having room to install it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a problem. That's, a problem. That, that, that's the problem with a really big ring is you have to get a long way away before you can install things. Yeah, that makes life worse for us. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, Janos, you have a question about the Lincoln cell? Yeah, uh, so you showed that you use the, the Lincoln cell, or you can use it for your excess measurement. Can you run uh, catalytic reactions on the Lincoln cell? Because there is a nice Lincoln cell that you can run in situ upper on the reactions. Are your uh, hatch set up for reactor study? Yes. Okay. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about, about how we use the Lincoln cell uh, later on in the talk. So I will, I will come back to this. But yes, we have done exactly that. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, you should continue, Bruce. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, so my cliffhanger was that uh, that that we're such an old-fashioned beamline that we force our users to type things on a keyboard. So, uh, let me talk now about how we actually run the beamline, and I'm going to start off with sort of a funny analogy here. So, so here's an experiment, and this is an experiment that I have a problem with. Now, my problem with this experiment isn't that that guy on the table is about to be dismembered by a bunch of spinning uh, knives because, you know, this experiment has been through the proposal review committee and it got awarded beam time and it got allocated beam time. So there must be a good science reason for this. My problem with this experiment is that it's extremely inefficient. Um, only one guy can be strapped to the table at a time, and there's only one bucket to collect the blood that comes off of the table. And then to get the experiment started, the professor has to walk around that glass wall and pull a lever. It's just ridiculously inefficient. You can only do one such experiment at a time. And so the thing I'm going to get into now is how we handle the problem of automation at BMM and how... Um, you know, how that gets integrated into the operations at the Beamline and how that becomes part of what I think is a good user experience, a good, you know, our users get to be very productive and, and uh, uh, are easily able to conceive of interesting experiments at the Beamline. So how does this work? Well, okay, first of all, I wanna, I wanna go back to the cliffhanger and the fact that I make people type. And um, uh, the, the flip side of that is that I'm sort of an obsessive documentation writer and I actually provide, uh, provide support for the people who are stuck having to do this horrible chore of typing commands at the command line. So we, we help, um, but there's more to it than that. Let me talk about 
Let me now talk about some of the things that people type at the command line. And the one I want to start with is the command that we use at the beam line for changing the configuration of the photon delivery system. Now, part of my reason for wanting to talk about this comes from a lot of, um, you know, a lot of proposals that I read for other synchrotrons. And one thing that strikes me as well, increasingly amazing to me as time goes on and I'm more and more comfortable with the operations at BMM and sort of surprised that this remains an issue in proposals is people often um, say in their experimental plan that they have to devote hours, sometimes even shifts to setting up the experiment to measure a different edge of the experiment. And that, um, you know, that might be the sort of exaggeration that our users make when they're writing their proposals to try and justify a big block of time. But in some cases, I know that it is, it is a chore to do an energy change at the beam line. And one of the things we've worked on really hard at BMM is to make this not a chore. Um, it kind of is a chore. There's a lot of stuff that has to be done. And that, that eight item list is a list of all of the things that have to happen to go from measuring at one edge to measuring it at another edge. And if you add up all of the possible axes that might need to move, it's, it's 17 motors that all have to go to the right place. Um, in practice, what we do for most of those axes is use a lookup table that is kept carefully up to date. Um, and then there's a couple of scans that are done that have an easy interpretation so that the scan and the resulting positioning of the motor can be done in an automated way. This whole process takes between two and six minutes. Uh, the difference between two and six minutes being whether the harmonic rejection mirror needs to slide between stripes. That, that turns out that that needs to be a really slow motor and uh, is just sort of the rate limiting step of the process. Um, this command, which is simple to use, you just tell it what element you want to measure. And um, unless you want to measure an L2 or an L1 edge, it will figure out from the element and the known energy range of the beam line, it will just figure out what element you want to go measure. Um, you, there's an argument, you might need to tell it whether or not you want to focus uh, the beam. But basically you just, you, you type in this command that says, go set up for this element and it goes and sets up for this element. And this is really reliable. It's done by users. I don't have to be there. Uh, it's reliable enough to be done at three in the morning. And more to the point, it's reliable enough that it can be a part of the automation. And again, I'm going to talk about that some more real soon. Um, carrying on this theme, we have a similar command for changing between the monochromator crystals. That's not a thing that gets done very often during a user's experiment, but it again is fully automated and reliable. Uh, so how, now the really big question, how do we, how do we measure an XF scan? And um, uh, so this slide, I, I'm taking a step away from the concept of a good user experience to give you, uh, to give you some of the background about how this is, uh, this is implemented. Um, the XF scan, the sort of atomic unit of measuring XF spectra at the beam line, um, wants to read information uh, from a little tiny file that looks like the thing that's on the left. Basically, there's a form that needs to be filled out where the brown words are, um, you know, the, the sort of the parameters of the XF scan and the, the black words on the other side of the equal sign are the values of those parameters. And, and so this file serves the same purpose that a form in a GUI might serve. Um, if you were to just run an XF scan, there at the bottom is the command you would type at the command line and some text would come on screen that would prompt you for which control file you want to read in, and then it will go off and, and, and measure XFs. So that's sort of the background 
Those are the sorts of things that people have to type at the command line. But how does an experiment actually go forward at the beam line? Well, let me show you an example of something we do an awful lot of at BMM. Um, we do an awful lot of uh, what constitute, I suppose, XC2 experiments, samples that are interesting that don't have to be in a special environment. Our normal mode of operation for such things is that our users have these wheels with slots cut in them. The, the slots are numbered. Uh, there you can see a couple of the numbers. And there are two rings of slots. So this holds up to 48 samples. Um, and here's an example on screen of something being measured. It looks like we're on slot 21 and looking at the inner ring of that with the fluorescence detector pointed at it. Um, how does this experimental setup get turned into an experiment at the beam line? Well, it works like this. Uh, we have these lightly formatted spreadsheets that our users fill out with a description of what the experiment should be. Um, the basic concept here is that every row of the spreadsheet describes a measurement on a sample. So what goes into the spreadsheet? Well, there's a line at the top that is sort of, this is, the, the green line is intended to be a thing to just make it easier to edit the spreadsheet and uh, make it so that the spreadsheet doesn't require as much data entry. Um, the green line is sort of the default. And a cell below that, below the green line that is left blank, will use the value from the green line. In that way, the spreadsheet is much less, there's much less editing that needs to be done in the spreadsheet, and that's a nice thing. Uh, then there are these two columns all the way to the left that uh, have slot number and ring, meaning inner or outer ring. So for the uh, experiment that you see here, uh, it would be uh, it would be something like something like this row right here, or twenty one. It's there's not a twenty one on this list. You would specify the correct slot number, which ring to go to, and as part of the automation, it would go the the sample stage would go to that place. Uh, this column here is for specifying sort of like a file name stub. There are going to be a lot of files that get written out for use by the user, and those files are all going to be based off of this name that is provided by uh, provided by the user. Uh, the next part, and this is this is I think the really interesting part of this. The next part specifies what's going to be measured. So in this case. What's going on is we, we started up, up above on the spreadsheet, we started measuring the titanium K edge on those samples. And then we're gonna switch to the zirconium K edge. And then we're gonna switch to the cerium L3 edge. And with some caveats, um, this can basically run all by itself. The stage will rotate and move to the correct ring. Uh, the Automation will notice if an edge change has been requested, and if it has been, it will do what the change edge command that I talked about a little bit before. It will do that all as part of the automation. It is quite plausible that you could set something like this up to go over all 48 samples, multiple edges, walk away, come back 12 or 24 or 36 hours later, and barring a beam dump or something like that, that's exactly what will have happened. Um, then the next several columns here are metadata about the sample that the user supplies. That is, I encourage the user to uh, tell us the composition or stoichiometry, that's the first column there, how the sample was prepared for the XFs measurement, and then the third column is anything else the user wants to say about the um, uh, about the sample. And I encourage my users to fill those columns out completely for a number of reasons. For one thing, this spreadsheet serves as a documentation of 
both the intent of the experiment and what was done. And so if you put that information in, you will have a record of what everything you did was. But this information also gets propagated along to the data product that is the output of the beamline. And that is what I will talk about in the third section of the talk, how information metadata like this gets used by the beamline. So a spreadsheet like that gets filled out. You run at, this is, so we get back to the part where we have to type a little bit. You type the xlsx command, xlsx being the common file extension of an Excel spreadsheet. And it asks you a couple questions about which Excel file you want to read in and which tab from the spreadsheet that you want to read from. And it generates basically a big long list of measurements to make and gives you an estimate for how long it's going to take. The, the time that like, the example that I'm showing here was enough stuff to take about three and a half, uh, about three and a half hours. Um, just to give, um, to, to take a step back and, and like lift up the curtain and show you what's going on. Uh, the thing that reads the spreadsheet is basically a code generator. It reads every line of the spreadsheet and makes a little paragraph of commands which are syntactically correct Python. Uh, Blue Sky, our, our environment that we use at the Beamline is a Python thing. So we make syntactically correct Python. Um, and you can see that we say, move to slot 15, move to the inner ring, move the detector to the correct position and measure XFs with the parameterization that we want. Um, and then for the spreadsheet, for every line, there will be a little paragraph like that. And there'll just be a big long list of commands that get run when you, when you run this thing. Um, and then of course, if there's an energy change uh, in there, then at the top of this paragraph, there will be a change edge command that takes care of changing the energy. Um, so how does this actually work for our users? Well, these objects I consider to be consumables at the beam line. They're just not very expensive. So I give these away to my users. In fact, I mail them to my users well in advance of their experiment so they can mount up their samples at home. And then I send them the link to the spreadsheet and they can fill out their spreadsheet at home. It's really, really common for users to show up at the Beamline with all their samples ready to go, all their spreadsheets ready to go. And for an 8 a.m. start time, we're often measuring data by 9 or 9.30. Um, and so this is great. I mean, uh, this is really great because, um, you know, I typically give two or three days of beam time. Saving a few hours at the beginning of the experiment, um, saving a few hours at the beginning of the experiment is actually a significant fraction of two days of beam time. And so I want my users to be as efficient as possible and to show up and collect more data than they know what to do with. And this is, this whole system is really helping with that. Um, now for these things, these are all just laser cut. So it's really easy to just sort of make different styles of these things. As you can see in the picture, our standard one is just sort of slots. Uh, some of our users like uh, having 13 millimeter holes, 13 millimeters being a common size for a, the, the die of a pellet press. And those pellets just fit right in and just secure them with a little bit of tape on either side. We also have some that the, are laser cut in half and these are easier to get in and out of a dry, uh, a glove box uh, if you are worried about uh, um, you know, keeping, keeping oxygen sensitive samples safe. So um, I, I, what I think, I think this is like an obvious point at this point. What I'm trying to convince you is that at BMM, uh, the spreadsheet is the GUI. Um, I could, I mean, I think everybody knows that, that I could, I've done this before, I could write a GUI. Um, but any GUI that I would write for the Beamline to do what I've talked about so far, I would need to replicate the functionality of a spreadsheet. And I find that kind of ridiculous because spreadsheets already exist. And literally every single user that I have at the Beamline already knows how to use Excel. I don't have to train anyone to use Excel. I would have to train somebody to use a GUI that does the same thing as Excel. So for me, running the Beamline, leveraging a spreadsheet has proven to be 
this just wonderful efficiency multiplier. Um, I don't want to overstate this. Of course, when the users show up, I have to train them how to use the beam line and how to understand the beam line. And there's some training for those who are unfamiliar with using the command line. Um, but it's worked really well so far. And the, the footnote that's on this page is just a statistic. I have a really good rate of return on end of run forms at BMM. So I have a pretty good sampling of the kinds of comments and complaints that my users have. And I have gotten exactly zero complaints about having to use a command line. Uh, it's far more common that my users appreciate these the efficiencies gained by this user experience that I'm, I'm presenting here. Uh, it's been really, really good. Um, so the goal here, the goal at BMM is, the, so this was the XC2 sample holder. In some sense, that's the easiest thing to provide automation for. My, my goal is to do this for every instrument that we use at the Beamline. Uh, what you see on the left is the version of the spreadsheet for the Lincoln stage. And you see that instead of the positional movement columns, that there's a target temperature column and a settling time column. That is, you can tell it, uh, go to this temperature and then wait for some amount of time for the temperature to equilibrate. And then in exactly the same way, it can step through temperatures. The, the sample, with a sample on the Lincoln stage, you can step through temperatures. Uh, many, many slides ago, I showed you this eight sample holder for glancing angle XFs. Uh, we have a spreadsheet that is specifically for that, uh, a way of turning from sample to sample and there are little spinners to suppress diffraction from the substrate and all the stuff you do with glancing angle XFs and that can all be controlled uh, from the spreadsheet. Uh, I've also got one for the lakeshore controller that we use with our displex cryostat, as well as a just sort of more generic move two axes and make a grid of measurements on two generic axes. So this same concept is used for a lot of different automation chores. And the concept is that as we bring new stuff online at the beam line, we want to, um, we want to use this approach. Um, a little aside, a lot of beam lines look kind of like this silly picture here. There's a lot of computers at them, right? You have the thing where you have the main beam line computer, but then the potentiostat is being run on this computer and you know something else is being run on this computer and something else is being run on this computer. Uh, this is kind of like the octopus problem. You have to be an octopus to run all these computers. The, the problem with that is that it gets to be hard to make the level of automation I'm talking about uh, largely for two reasons. It can be difficult to uh, trigger, uh, to synchronize the staging and triggering of different parts of the experiment if just very disparate control systems are in use, as is often the case for a commercially supported instrument like, like the Potentiostat. Um, it can also be really difficult to gather up uh, quality metadata of the sort that I'm going to talk about in the next part of the talk. And so, um, uh, you know, what this means for me is that I really need to press the controls people to help me bring EPICS and or OFID support, uh, OFID being the uh, instrument interface layer of Blue Sky. Uh, we need EPICS and OFID support for everything that comes on the beam line. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jerry, this is my next uh, stopping point before I go on to the last bit of our user experience. So Excellent. It's questions. well it's well timed. We got great questions. Uh, Adam Hoffman, you should unmute and ask your question, please. Hey, Bruce, thanks for the talk. Um, in your change energy script, do you do any calibration to the edge as well, given that large energy changes might have just drift in the mono? Uh, no, I've, I, so the, I do infrequent calibrations over a very large energy range, and um, the monochromator is pretty reliable. It's not as good as I wish it was, but, um, but uh, the, the short answer to your question is, is no, I trust the calibration to stay good for long periods of time. Okay, uh, Simon Bear, you should unmute. Do you have a question? Uh, there we go. Hi, Bruce. Fantastic. Hi, uh, Simon. Good. 
a couple of things. Um, have you put any thought into automating the number of scans? I saw in your spreadsheet the user has to predetermine how many scans are required. You yeah. Put any thought into that. And then second question is: Can you say? Can you comment something about positional stability of the beam at BMM? Sure. So Thanks. answer to the first question is uh, yes. I'm thinking really hard about that. Um, uh, as you'll see in the last or the second to last slide of the talk, uh, I'm going to talk about some of like our plans for the future. Um, uh, basically, we're working on coming up with a system that, uh, like one way of one way you might refer to it is a mutable queue of measurements. That is uh, basically what I was describing with the spreadsheet. But instead of like generating a list of measurements that will get run, you generate a list of measurements and put them into a queue and the top of the queue is pulled off and run and you can be constantly adding to the queue. Uh, that's a thing we're working towards at the beam line. And so my concept there would be to set the number of repetitions column right here to one for everything on the wheel and then go through and measure it once. And either with a machine agent or a human agent making a decision about how many more samples, how many more measurements to make, those mm -hmm. would then get pushed to the end of the queue so that there would be either a human intervention or machine intervention way of deciding how to solve that problem. And that's sure. something we're working towards. Thanks, Bruce. Um, beam positional stability, it's, um, for the focused beam, it's pretty good because we have the benefit of a focusing mirror and in principle, every point on the surface of the mirror focuses to the same place. That's even almost true. Uh, we don't have quite the same positional stability requirements that a lot of our colleagues do because our, you know, if our smaller beam is a 250 micron full width path max, and it's not staying in the same place within five or 10 microns, I'm not sure that I care. So um, it may not be quite at the level that you're asking for, but it hasn't been a big problem yet. Uh, the unfocused beam certainly moves because in operation, we typically go, uh, we have a, a way of deciding an energy to go to and then go out of fixed exit mode into pseudo, pseudo channel cut mode to measure XFs with, uh, well, focused or unfocused beam. That has the problem that with unfocused beam, the beam walks up and down on the sample. But there again, I'm making an argument of scale. If you're using a five by one millimeter beam and the beam moves by 50 microns, it probably doesn't matter. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Paula, you have a question? Yes, um, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Bruce, for the nice presentation. I have a practical question. Um, the wheel that you show, this automatic wheel, uh, many of the uh, user samples are air sensitive. Do you mm -hmm. have a way to load this in a glove box and seal it or a different? Uh, so I have these half wheels, wheels that are already cut in half uh, that fit through the load lock. And then protecting that in a way that's appropriate for the experiment is just a problem I leave up to the user. Uh, it's often adequate to uh, seal things inside of little like, you know, heat seal bags or something like that and mount the heat seal bags on the wheel. Uh, that's one thing that people do. Um, you know, all, all the standard solutions from there. I don't, I don't have a specifically engineered solution to that. Okay, thank you. All right, a question from Roman. Hi Bruce, I actually have two questions. So the uh, first one is about the gains in your uh, amplifiers. Is this automated? Because uh, uh, the, the sample density can vary and it can vary during the scan. Uh, do you check yep. it beforehand or is it done? Yep. So the, um, the uh, signal chain that I use for the ion chambers is very linear over very many decades. Um, I use uh, a bit of electronics that was developed here in-house uh, by Pete Siddons and uh, others in the instrumentation group here at Brookhaven or the instrumentation division here at Brookhaven. Um, and they're the same, uh, the same, uh, uh, 80 amplifiers and ADCs 
that are used with our beam position monitors here at the facility, and they, they turn out to work great for ion chambers. And so the, the answer to my the answer to your question is it's not automated because I never change them. And they're linear over so many decades that uh, even changing energies, uh, I just I just don't change them and the data comes out looking great. Sounds like magic. Do you sell this to yourself? Uh, you can talk to Pete Siddons about buying them. I'm not in the business of selling that or anything else. <laughs> okay, yeah, good, great. Yeah, that, my second question is about this uh, <laughs> sample wheels. They are so colorful. There must be a lot of a lot of different elements inside there. So G giving they, them colors. <laughs> they're color. They're colorful because during the last two years, it's become extremely difficult to get your hands on sheets of plastic, and so I tell the design engineer to just order whatever he can get his hands on. And so every time he makes them for me, they come to me in a different color. Um, I have one user in particular who looks at low concentrations of bromine in things. And I have to measure each one for her before I send it to her um, to make sure that it doesn't have too much bromine in it. So yes, it's a concern. <laughs> yeah, I see. Question. Well, well, Basically, we uh, use similar wheels, but we 3D print them right in our lab. So it's an, another solution, and you don't depend on well, any. I mean, so, so this, I mean, this is just cheaper and quicker on the laser cutter than it is in the 3D printer. And, you know, it's the same situation. You need to know what the material you're using is. The same is true with the 3D printer. Um, and I'm not very cautious about it, as you can see, because I have really colorful wheels, but mm -hmm. it's because I take what I can get. Okay, we've okay. got about 10 minutes left in the regular part, then we'll have questions. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Why don't you continue, Bruce? Uh, sure. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is uh, sort of a data curation problem. That's the last part of this user experience thing that I, I want to talk about. So what is what does the user want from in, in the area of data curation? So um, the data and the metadata have to be captured and given to the user in a way that they can use. And metadata can be a whole lot of stuff. And the common thing about all different kinds of metadata is that it's really damn tedious. Humans are awful at collecting metadata. Um, computers, however, are super good at collecting metadata. And so I want to turn over the problem of collecting metadata over to the computer as much as possible. Uh, there are some other things about the data curation and the state of the beam line. Um, the user needs to know like what's going on and needs to know where the data can be found. Um, and in the sense of knowing where the data is, it has to be readily accessible so that it can be used by the user. Here's how I solve that problem. Every time the XS command is run, so for every line in a spreadsheet, there's some number of repetitions. When the number of repetitions are done, a dossier is made. Now, Dossier is my fancy word for a static HTML file that points to other files on disk. Now, the thing about this solution I'm about to show you is that if you pick up the entire data folder off of the Beamline computer and put the entire folder unedited, unmoved around onto another computer, these HTML files will still work, but they are hard links in a directory tree, in a folder tree. So it's really, it's easy to break also. But as long as I explain that to the users, it hasn't been a big problem. So for every sample that gets measured, um, one of these files is generated. What's in here? Well, at the top, there is the sample composition, sample preparation, and anything else you wanna say, stuff from the spreadsheet gets propagated through to this dossier. Some information about the state of the instrument that you're using gets written down, and some information about the scan that you, uh, that you just set off uh, gets written down. I gather the position of not just to select few motors, I've decided to just write down the position of every motor on the beam line every time in every dossier. Um, you know, the vast majority of the time, that's not helpful or useful information. Every so often, it's a lifesaver to have that written down somewhere. 
Um, I have a lot of visual metadata. Uh, I said way up front that I have a lot of cameras pointed at the experiment. So I capture an image from the webcam. I capture an image from this um, uh, pinhole camera, this uh, just an analog pinhole camera that I like a lot because it has an infinite depth of view. So it's usefully different from my other cameras. And then I have a couple of uh, USB cameras with really nice lenses on them that I can move around and point at the sample in some appropriate way. And I have two of those. And those are usually close enough with a good enough lens that you can actually read what's written in Sharpie on the plastic wheel. You can you know, read things. Uh, and that, that turns out to be really helpful. So those all get written and linked to in the dossier. The user gets sent home with all of these photos. Of course, again, you know, obviously these photos are going to be very repetitive. They're all going to look about the same. But every so often, you know, you just really need to like see that you were on the right sample or verify that something was done correctly. And so having this available in a really consumable way is really important. Um, at the end of the sequence of repetitions, in this example, there wasn't a sequence of repetitions, it's just one scan, but normally there would be multiple repetitions and you would then, they would get added up and then processed and all that is done with Larch. Um, so, you know, so you know it's, it's done well. Uh, and then this, this nice picture is made and linked to in the dossier. So you have a, a rough sense of what the process data looks like. And then I, I want to point out also over here, there's this funny little number here. That's actually a little thing you can click on. If you click on it, it opens up some hidden text, which is this big long string that is the database key where the full record of the experiment is kept. So for example, this is a... Um, uh, a fluorescence detect, a fluorescence measurement. Somewhere behind the scenes, there's the HDF5 file that the IOC for the for the Express Three writes out that has really everything that got measured. This this of course is just looking at the um, at the uh, uh, fluorescence channel for whatever element is being measured here. Uh, it looks like it might be titanium. Um, but there's the whole record from the fluorescence detector that gets stored somewhere. So with the database key, you can go back and reconstruct any part of what was measured or recover any data that might get lost because it's all the data all goes into a database and then gets slurped out again for the user's consumption. Um, if we're doing a fluorescence measurement at some energy above the edge, I'll take a fluorescence scan before starting the sequence of scans. I'll take an XRF spectrum just because that's another thing that's easy to do and can be done for the user in an automated manner. And again, the unique identifier in the database for that measurement gets uh, recorded in the dossier should you ever need to go back and find it again. There's a little bit more information. Some other stuff is down sort of below the fold of this picture. Um, we use uh, Slack for communication at the Beamline. Um, and the, the Beamline control system talks to Slack. So here is an example of four repetitions on whatever this sample is. Uh, and so you see with timestamps as each scan is measured. And then at the end, this picture here from the dossier gets uploaded to, um, uh, gets uploaded to Slack uh, so that it can be seen on Slack. And this is, this is lovely. This is the biggest quality of life improvement that I've had at the Beamline in ages because now I can be at home, sitting on the patio, having a nice beverage, and I don't really have to worry so much about the Beamline. I can take a quick glance at my phone and know that things are happening at the Beamline and whether they're desperate for my attention or the Beamline is just chugging along. And this helps me a lot. But the thing that's lovely is the same is true for my users. Uh, at the beginning of the experiment, I invite my users to the Slack channel and they can be sitting in their hotel room or, you know, depending upon who it is, I, they might be sitting with me on a patio somewhere having a nice beverage and we can know that the Beamline is doing its thing. This level of communication is the best damn thing there is. This is, this is great. It doesn't have to be Slack. Any messaging platform would work. I, I just happen to use Slack. This concept of using a messaging platform and having the Beamline talk straight at it is great. Um, I, see, I'm, running, I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna run through the last few things. Um, 
Currently, uh, the data gets synced to a Google Drive. We are moving to Globus. Uh, that hasn't quite happened yet here at the Beamline. But the point of this is that in almost real time, the user has access to their data. When a scan finishes, the data gets synced to the remote storage solution. Uh, and so data is available as it's measured. Uh, that gets back to Simon's question. The human in the loop solution to that problem is made available uh, even to somebody remote with this kind of uh, data syncing with uh, the remote solution. So I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I can't talk at great length. We're going to get new ion chambers at the beam line that will be uh, uh, an improvement even on the already great signal chains that we have for our ion chambers. Uh, this is a, a, a scheme Pete Siddons and I have been working on for a while and it's about to come to fruition. One of the things they will enable is something that was supposed to happen in the summer of 2020 at BMM. Uh, we decided to do something else instead in the summer of 2020. Uh, and so we didn't get to start working on implementing quick scanning, uh, but we are finally going to get around to that um, starting later this year. I can hardly wait. Uh, some other things that we have coming up, I'm gonna be getting a new experimental table to replace the problematic one that we have right now. I'm hoping to properly integrate the Potentia stat. Uh, this is a bigger topic than I have time to talk about, but will enable a lot more kinds of experiments. And then the last two points were uh, sort of getting at what Simon asked me about uh, decision making at the beam line. Uh, so our next proposal deadline is at the end of the month. There's a whole bunch of information about how to find us at BMM. Um, hey, come and come and do an experiment with me. It's kind of a fun beam line to use, and I haven't met all of you who are at this talk, so I'd like to do that someday. Oh, I'm done. I'm done, Jerry. I, I, got, I got hung up on mute. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, wonderful, wonderful talk. We have a, we have a few questions. Sure. Um, to begin, Tim Hyde. Hi there, Bruce. Uh, I think you might have just been touching on that at the end. Um, in, in, in terms of your sort of spreadsheet uh, methodology there, is there any sort of AI in the spreadsheet so that it would minimize time for edge changes that take place if you're looking at multiple samples? Um, so I don't have anything like that implemented, although I certainly try and have that conversation with my users and get them to think about that because there are obviously better ways to organize that in the spreadsheet than others. And I try and get them to do that. Um, but then there, there are other situations where it might be a little bit hard to uh, um, like really conceive of all the possible constraints on that. So that just seems like a hard problem that I haven't worked on yet. Uh, but we certainly, I certainly think about it in practice. And if you had a brilliant solution to that, uh, well, you know where to find me. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Just leave it to an AI expert. All right. Uh, Matthew Marcus, you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering about, uh, about how better to automate the uh, microscopy beam lines like at, uh, at our Stixum, uh, when you put in a new sample, you have to navigate roughly to it, take a large area image, roughly focus on it, find the spot that, uh, that looks good, not too thick, not too thin, you zoom in on it, blah, 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 and it takes forever. And I was wondering if there is some yeah. automation that could be done in a better way. Yeah, uh, I don't know, I don't think I have anything in, like specific that I can come up with right off of the top of my head right here at one o'clock when my tummy is rumbling for lunch. <laughs> um, but I, I guess I'll just say, I'll, I'll say a broader comment than that, which is that nothing that I presented here today, um, along with, I, I really wanna repeat this again, nothing that I presented here today is exactly novel. It's all stuff that somebody else has implemented someplace else. I'm just trying to bring it into my package. And um, the thing about this is that none of this worked from day one. Uh, this was all developed as I developed experience with the instrument. And so really most of this didn't really come together and start working extremely well until the whole world stopped two years ago. And I had to figure out how to run a mail-in program where I was gonna be the only damn person at the beam line. And if I'm gonna be the only damn person at the beam line, 
well, the beam line needs to do most of the work and I need to do very little of the work. So it was really experiential and observing what chores get done over and over again. I, I know that I'm not telling you anything you don't know, uh, uh, Matthew, um, but that's my really my best comment on that. Yeah, and as to the plastic wheels, I think uh, the, the color of those wheels is, comes from organic compounds. So we like, probably don't add new elements. Except when it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, All right. Bromine is from the polymer. Very, very good. Uh, uh, Matthew Newville, uh, uh, I'm going to let you ask the last question of the seminar. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Hi, Bruce. Um, that, very nice job. That was Thank awesome. you. Uh, can, I just, can I just chime in on, on Matthew Marcus? I mean, from you, that means cool. a lot. So, yes, please do. So, uh, and to Matthew Marcus's point, so, so some of us do this sort of automation with micro probe he wants to. So, we could chat about that separately. Um, my question is for, for you, Bruce, is have you given any thought on how the metadata you collect and and have can go into down can go downstream to the analysis program? So you know, can can someone use this metadata and say these three samples were next to each other, they should be they're better to merge, or these three samples were actually on the same sample? And so is there a way to get your metadata formatted into a way that could go downstream? Um Wow, that's a big question. So have so figure that out over lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, you know, I think this comes down to so so Matt and I. This is a question that Matt and I have been thinking about on some level together and apart for a long time. And he and I, um, he and I, like went through the problem of figuring out how do you record metadata in a file, like an ASCII file that you write out about an XF spectrum. And the solution we came up with was to uh, come up with a dictionary of interesting things. And so if I understood your question, the, the heart of the question was how to recognize the three positions that are close enough together that you should measure them. That's a problem of having interpretable, it's a language problem. That is, somebody who is not immediately present needs to recognize that those three positions have that property. And that means that you have to have the right language to tag it that way. So I, I think it's a dictionary problem. Yeah, there's also there's also the question of like, if you if you're being line for if you guys are if you're writing metadata and my beam line is writing metadata, can we do that in a way that the downstream analysis programs, which you know maybe we have some thought of, or control over that too, can like recognize what beamline A, B, and X have put in for this metadata and like be able to so so use again, them in the same way. Again, I think I think I want to give the same answer. It's a you're talking about a linguistics problem, and it's a really challenging thing because you know we've pretty much at least for this seminar series. We solved the linguistics problem of what language yeah. should we give yeah. the presentations in. But it's yeah. basically, I think you're asking basically the same question, and that is what exactly is the lexicon that a beamline should use to right. send its it send its product out into the world? And that means that you and I have done the wrong thing by coming up with slightly different solutions to this problem. And, and you and I aren't even like the worst thing because you and I think a lot alike, but then there, there are people who do really different solutions that seem crazy compared to what I do. And, right, right. you know, we all need to talk together. It's, I, I see it as a linguistics problem, essentially. I, I don't know, that's not a very satisfying answer because it's not a solution, but I, I think we, you know, we, we need to agree on how to say certain things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is that sensible? Does that even get close to what you're asking? I think so. Yeah. I mean, could we also like just come up like, is there, is this a good opportunity to think about how to get those Well, I mean, not right of, now because some, I want to something, go to lunch. You know, well, so over lunch, get, you know, think about <laughs> reading, okay. not, not just writing the metadata, but reading the metadata. I'll, I'll, I'll solve <laughs> all of that over lunch and, and let you know at one o'clock. Yeah, look at All that. right. Okay. So the, the clear conclusion of this is that whenever I invite anyone who's an East Coast speaker, it should come with a Grubhub delivery at 1.10 uh, p.m. <laughs> their time. Hey, uh, with, before, before you close this out, Jerry, I just yes. want to thank, uh, I, I just want to thank, thank uh, Jonathan for a very kind comment that he put into the chat. Thank you. That is a very flattering thing to say. I, I really appreciate it. Okay. 
then let's all thank Bruce. It was a terrific talk. And I will uh, stop the recording and um, people can chat for uh, maybe just a minute or two before we let Bruce uh, 